And we're going to read some scripture. First Samuel, we're going to go Old Testament today. First Samuel chapter 15 in verse 17. A little bit of context here before we read. This is a passage about King Saul, the first king of Israel. And the, and the Bible teaches us that he got instruction from the Lord to take out the entire nation of the Amalekites. And he took that instruction and he did it in his own way and he began to disobey God. He kept the king alive. He kept the best of the cattle alive. And the prophet Samuel, God's representative in the day, came to confront Saul. Anybody grateful for friends that confront you? Oh, nobody is. Okay, it's all good. But Saul was that friend that confronted the prophet that confronted uh, Samuel, confronted Saul because he disobeyed God. And we pick up in verse 17 about this interaction. Check out what it says. It says, Samuel said to Saul, although you were once small in your own eyes, did you not become the head of the tribes of Israel? The Lord anointed you king over Israel. And he sent you on a mission saying, go and completely destroy those wicked people, the Amalekites. Wage war against them until you have wiped them all out. Why did you not obey the Lord? Why did you pounce on the plunder and do evil in the eyes of the Lord? And then uh, Saul speaks up, but, no, 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 no. I, but, but, but I did obey the Lord. He said, I went out on the mission the Lord assigned me, and I completely destroyed the Amalekites. And I brought back Agag, Agag the, their king. Okay, so that's a contradiction. That's a, that's a starburst. Okay, that's a, no? All right, tough crowd. Um, a contradiction. I completely destroyed them, but I, I kept the best of the cattle and I kept the king alive. And he said, the soldiers took sheep and cattle from the plunder and the best of what we had to devote it to God in order to sacrifice them to the Lord your God at Gilgal. And Samuel says something profound. He says, does the Lord delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as much as in obeying the Lord? To obey is better than sacrifice and to heed is better than the fat of rams. For rebellion is like the sin of divination and arrogance like the evil of idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has rejected you as king. And then Saul said to Samuel, I have sinned and I have violated the Lord's command and your instructions. I was afraid of the men and so I gave in to them. Somebody say, ooh, that's that Old Testament right there. Hey, the title of today's message before we pray and get started is, if you can put it up on the screen, the title of today's message is How to Fall Like Saul. How to fall like Saul. Look at your neighbor and say, hey, neighbor, don't fall like Saul. Come on, look at your other neighbor and say, neighbor, better call Saul. <laughs> no, I'm just talking about, like what? How to fall like Saul. I believe God's going to speak to us today. Let's pray in this atmosphere. Lord, we love you. And we pray, God, that you would speak a word that would transform our lives. I pray for every first-time guest, every regular here. God, I thank you, Lord, that you have a word for each and every one of us. Speak to us today in a profound way and do what only you can do. And that's change the human heart. We love you. We thank you that the grasshoppers are no longer in our city. And the plague has passed. <laughs> in Jesus' name. Amen. Take your seat. Take your seat. Them grasshoppers. Sister Kimberly, I'm going to preach. I almost got in a fight two weeks ago. Um, it was one of those battles that picked me. I didn't pick this battle. You ever wake up one day and just like, God, I'm going to dedicate my day to you. I'm going to serve you. I'm going to do my devos. I'm going to pray. I'm going to dedicate everything I am to you. I went to work on a Wednesday two weeks ago, and I was trying to be a good servant. And, and Pastor Benny asked me, hey, Mike, can you take my car to the car wash? I'm going into a meeting. I said, absolutely. I'm going to serve the man of God. And he told me to take it at 12 p.m. because there was a discount. And so you know Pastor Benny with them discounts. And so I, I got into his, his car and I drove a two-minute drive to the car wash. And I kid you not, I get into the car wash. The guy calls me in, bring your car up to the front. I get out my car. And there is a man that pulled up right next to me. He was about 45 years in age. He had protruding eyes, a beer belly. I looked him up and down. I was like, is, are you good? He looks at me and he begins to curse me out. He begins to use every curse word in the book in a three-sentence frame. He begins, to, he begins to go ham on me. He says, how dare you cut us? We've been waiting in line for 35 minutes. How dare you better get your beepity beepity boppity car out of here. And I said, sir, first of all, it's not my car. And second of all, you could chill. 
because we're all here. I listen to the worker. I'm just doing what he told me to do. I'm just trying to serve my pastor. Why are you, why are you berating me? Why are you doing this to me? And he began to yell, and he began to curse me out. And you know me, I'm not a fighter by nature. If you push me, I'll probably deflect it. I'll probably get somebody bigger. And be, hey, hold me back. Hold me back. You ever done that in a fight? Hold me back. No, no, what you going to do? Hold me back. If he punched me, I could probably take it and be like, hey, man. But, but, but this man begins to attempt to spit on me. Ooh. I could dodge a punch. I could dodge a wrench. I could dodge a ball. Why are these movie quotes coming to my head? But if, I, if, if liquid comes out of your mouth and hits me in my face, I don't care how much I fasted. I don't care how much I prayed. I'm swinging. I'm going many Pacquiao in this place today. I was just like, bro. He begins to approach me. He makes the noise of spitting on me. The G Jesus himself stood in front of the spit, deflected it. I didn't feel anything. And so the guy was breaking us up. And he said, hey, you guys got, you got, the manager was like, get, get, get both of you, get out of here. I said, me? I didn't do anything. And the worker was like, yeah, my, my dude didn't do anything. I told him to come in. This guy came and picked this fight. And, it, you know, lo and behold, he kicked us out. He kicked us out. And I was like, whatever. I'm just going to give these keys back to Pastor Benny. I'm going to let, I was like, Pastor Benny, you got to find somebody else to clean your car. Um, <laughs> I try to, I try to, I try to help. And this battle picked me. I began to think about that guy at the car wash, how angry he was and how quick he was to fight and how a little thing pushed him off the edge. And isn't it a picture of humans today in our nation where they are fighting a physical battle and they are swinging with their arms, but really deep down inside, they are not dealing with something spiritual. That we are not just fighting a physical battle. We are fighting an unseen battle, a spiritual one. We are fighting a, 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 a battle of the unseen world. The Bible says the weapons we war, uh, we, 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 we war against is not flesh and blood but against principalities and powers of the unseen world. I know that sounds like Star Wars, but they took that from the Bible and made money off of it. We are fighting an unseen war, that your neighbor is not your enemy, that the president is not our enemy. It got quiet in the Presbyterian church, that the people we don't agree with are not our enemies. We are fighting a spiritual battle, and whether you know it or not, whether you, you are identifying the battle or you're not, there is a battle here. And we've been in a series called Battle Essentials because we're trying to equip the church to not let time pass you by where you're being passive, apathetic, and letting the enemy does what the enemy does. I'm trying to fight. The Bible would call this fight we're in a good fight. A good fight. That we are in a battle. So a couple of weeks ago, Pastor Benny opened up a series talking about King David talked about the story of David and Goliath. We love that story in church. It is a profound story. And it talked about David's battle. David was the second king of Israel. He was God, the, the king after God's own heart, so much so that God would promise to David that the, the, his lineage would bring forth the Messiah. He was an honorable king. He was an awesome king. He was the king we all want to follow. Today, I don't want to talk about David. I want to talk about the king that preceded David, King Saul. Because before there was a good king, there was a bad king. Before there was a king to follow, there was a king not to follow. And it ain't it like God to use in scripture contrast to teach us a lesson. He uses, he doesn't just teach us what we ought to do. He also teaches us by showing us what we not to do. That's bad English, but it rhymed, okay? What we not to do. He gives us examples of people that have fallen so that we don't have to experience the same mistakes. That you don't have to go through your own experiences to learn a lesson. You can learn something from somebody else's failure. And that tells me this, that God doesn't waste a season. God doesn't waste a moment. He can teach us with anything. That means if you had a bad father, your bad father could have taught you how to be a good father. That means you could have served under a bad leader, but that bad leader could teach you how to be a good leader. That means somebody else's mistake doesn't have to be your mistake. You could learn from somebody else's bad mistake so you don't have to make the same mistake again. We have to stop cursing what God is trying to use as a contrast in our life. 
We got to stop cursing people who were wrong to us and, and, and say, God, I'm going to step back and I'm going to learn a lesson even from the season I didn't like. And God would use King Saul in 1 Samuel to show what we not to do. What we not to do. I know we love stories about going from zero to hero. I know we love stories about going from rags to riches. But what about the stories about heroes going to zero? I know we love Creed. Michael B. Jordan got muscles. But Romeo and Juliet teach you a thing or two. That thing didn't end well. <laughs> contrast. Contrast. God uses contrast. You know, Saul... He started off phenomenal. He started off amazing. The Bible says he was good looking. The Bible says he was taller over everybody in Israel, that he had a presence to him, that he would walk in a room and he would grab the attention of people. He walked like a king before he was a king. He had military savvy. And when God went to anoint the first king of Israel, they said, hey, Saul, Saul, that's the man. And so Samuel obeyed God. Saul was a man from a good home. Saul had strength to him. Saul was outwardly perfect, as though, it as though it seemed. And the Bible says one random day, on a random day, he went to go and look for his dad's donkeys. Anybody lost donkey before? No? Ancient problems. He went to go look for his dad's two donkeys. He took a servant. Three days go by, they couldn't find the donkey. And the Bible says that the servant said to Saul, hey, maybe we can inquire to the prophet of God. Maybe he knows where these donkeys are. And so he said, that's a good idea. So on an average day, they begin to look for the prophet. They go into a town. Some women come out and they say, hey, do you know where the prophet is? And they said, absolutely. He's in the city. He's going to be meeting you as you walk into the city before the feast. And so they listen to the woman. And you know, that's a good place to clap, right? They listen to the woman. That's a whole nother sermon. Anyways, and he begins to go into the city. And the Bible says Saul met up with Samuel. He didn't even know the man. And he said, hey, hey, sir, do you know where the prophet is? And Samuel was like, yeah, that's me, man. And isn't it cool about God that he could take somebody who was looking for donkeys and make him run into his destiny? That God is the master orchestrator. That on an average day, he got Saul where he needed to get him. And he used donkeys to get him there. That God makes no accidents, that there is no coincidence, that God orchestrates our life, that you come from the home, you come from for a reason. You're sitting in church today for a reason. It doesn't matter the story you come from, but you're here today. It's not an accident. Come on, somebody. It was intentional. You could be looking for donkeys and run into your destiny. He wasn't even looking for it. I begin to think about how God operates in my life as I was studying the life of Saul that God took my mom from the Philippines and my dad from Saudi Arabia, let them meet in San Francisco. They disobeyed their parents, married each other because my dad was Muslim and she was Catholic. And they produced two kids and then they tried not to produce a third one and then I came out. <laughs> my mom was on birth control. She didn't know she was pregnant for five months. My gosh, that's why I came out a little awkward, you know. <laughs> Smoking them. I was going to say something, but I'm not going to say it. I might have been an accident to my parents, but I was not an accident to God. Come on, so that's a word for somebody today. You are not an accident to God. God knits you together in your mother's womb. And you might not have been planned by your parents, but you were planned by God. You might have been an oops baby, but God, you were an oops to God. God knew you. God knew your personality. God knew how you would look. Come on, somebody. He orchestrates. And he took Saul from an average day and made him run into the prophet. And the Bible would say they would feast together. And the beginning of the story is just phenomenal. They were walking on a ro road, and at one random moment, Samuel takes out a flask of oil and begins to anoint the, the head of Saul right on the road. So imagine that scene. He says, are you not the king that God has put over Israel? And he looked at Saul. He said, when you go home, the donkeys will be there. But when you go home, you're going to meet up with some prophets. And when you get to them, the spirit of God will fill you up powerfully. And you'll begin to prophesy. And you'll be changed into a different person. And anything you have your hand to do, God will bless because he is with you. What a beginning. What a start. But how do you start from the top and end here? 
the opposite of Drake. If you're, if you're over 35 or 40, and you didn't catch that, just skip that one. Started from the top, now he's here. What happened? How is somebody with such a great start and so bad? How is it that the mighty are forsaken, that the mighty fall? That at the end of Saul's life, he would have his armor stripped away from him like a child. He would have his head decapitated from his body. They would take his armor and put it into the temple to make sport of him like an animal. How is it that the mighty fall? How is it that the anointed are decapitated? How do you start off great and end up bad? Saul did not die from the arrows of the enemy. He did not die from the sword of an adversary. He died from his own sword. That was his story. He died from his, his own sword. That's a battle many of us are facing today. That you are not getting taken out by what other people say about you. You're getting taken out by what you say about you. The self-sabotage, the self-destruction, the self-compromise. We're dying on our own sword. Matter of fact, what people say about you is so irrelevant, you can stop praying about it. Because no weapon formed against you will prosper. And every tongue that rises up against you shall fall in Jesus' name. So stop tweeting about what people are saying about you. Stop subtweeting people. What do you say about you? Saul, he died on his, on his own sword. On his own sword. Some of you, you can relate to that metaphor. Because it's, it's like, you don't got to do nothing to me. I feel like I'm taking myself out at moments. With my own anxiety and my own thoughts and my own propensities and tendencies, I'm taking myself out. How do we stay in the battle? We got to deal with the sword that we keep killing ourselves with. And Saul died on his own sword. You know what the sword was? What was the sword? I'll give you the answer before the sermon ends. The sword was pride. It was pride. Ooh, got quiet in here. It was pride. He died on the sword of pride before he ever died on his physical sword. And pride is one of those things that is tricky, man. Pride is one of those things that creep in the heart of every human being at moments in life. It's a life that's self-governed, self-satisfied, self-sustained. It's a, it's, it's a mindset that is void of God, that I got this, I can do this, I don't need nobody. I got this, I want this, I need this. You know, the Bible says the enemy of our soul, Satan, was once Lucifer. He was an angel of the Lord. And he was in heaven, and he was one of the worshipers up there. And the Bible says he began to want worship for himself and God kicked him out of heaven and he became a fallen angel. That's where we get the scripture, pride comes before the fall. And so before we start to accuse people of falling, be careful, you might be up next. Because pride comes before the fall. And what's so crazy about the enemy is he wasn't taken out by an enemy. There was no enemy that took out the enemy because he was in heaven. So the enemy was taken out by, by, by his own self. The enemy became an enemy, enemy because the enemy was within him. Ooh, that's a whole nother message. We'll save that for next week or something. And he does the same in our life. If somebody else can't take us out, if somebody else's words won't take us out, he'll, let, he'll make us self-destruct. He specializes in turning us against ourselves because a house divided against itself will not stand. And so he, he thinks, if I can get this person to go against themselves, they will crumble down. He did it to himself, and he tries to do it to us. Pride. Pride. Pride is when you're so full of yourself, there's no room for God. Pride. As we begin to look at 1 Samuel chapter 15, we can look at how pride masquerades itself in different ways and look at the life of Saul and le learn from him to say that I don't have to end weak. I don't have to end bad. Come on, somebody. It's not how you start. It's how you finish. Some of you, you had a bad start to the year, but the year's not over. I know some of you may have not have kept in line with your New Year's resolutions, but come on, somebody. You can finish strong. Finish strong. 
So let's look at 1 Samuel 15. What did Saul do to take himself out with his own sword? Number one, I want you to write this down. Pride, pride, pride thinks partial obedience is obedience. Pride, it thinks partial obedience is obedience. He got clear instructions, take out the whole nation. But then he took that instruction, he said, I'm gonna do it my way. I know what you said, God, but, but I have something better in mind because I know best. And he thought partial obedience was obedience. Can you get honest in the house today? Has anybody ever partially obeyed God? Yeah, partially obeyed. It's when God calls you to love all people, but you're okay with just loving the people that look like you, talk like you, think like you. And so when he calls you to love somebody with a, dip, a different political persuasion than you or a different sexual orientation than you or a different theological outlook than you, you're like, ah, God, let me love my people. I don't know about them. It's when, it's when God calls you to serve and get planted and maybe for a season, you know God's knocking on the door of your heart to go, man, you got to get planted. You got to give your life and time to maybe build a house of God whatever that looks like. And you know God is speaking that to you, and you go, God, I, listen, God, listen, 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 Linda, listen, listen, listen. I know, I know you're telling me to do this, but can we make a deal? I won't serve, all right? I won't really get planted. I'll stop cussing, and you start blessing, and we can make this transaction. Is that cool, God? Is that cool? Partial obedience. God, I know gossip is wrong, but it's my bestie. It's my bestie. God, it's just my bestie. So I, I, let me, let, you know what I'm saying? Come on, not with my bestie. I could gossip with my bestie, right? Partial obedience. It's when God calls you to a single season, and instead of you obeying it fully, you just, you just say, God, all right, I'll trust you, and you don't have a boyfriend or girlfriend, but you treat other people like they are one, so you, it's like you have one without the title, and so you're trying to play a game with God and say, I don't have a boyfriend, I don't have a girlfriend, I'm single, but you DMing everybody. I, that, I don't know who that was for. Sweat rag. I've learned this about God. He's not to be trifled with. God is big, God is mighty, he's, he's awesome, he's good, and we can't trick him. I've learned this in my walk with Jesus. I can't give my best to the church and give my worst to my wife. God's not pleased with that. I can't give my best. I try to teach the young people, parents, get your young person to youth because we're trying to teach them. Yes, God wants you to serve in his house, but if you are serving in kids but you're not cleaning your room, that's not full obedience. I know you quote in scripture, but could you pass a test and study for a little bit? Amen. Parents should say amen in this place. Let's see. <laughs> Partial obedience. Partial obedience is disobedience. And disobedience can be defined this way. It's trying to get to God's destination our way. God, I want you to bless me, but I'm going to do it on my terms. God, I want you to free me up, but I'm going to do it on my terms. God, I want to be strong, but I'm going to do that on my terms. And God says, no, you can't get to my destination your way. You got to trust my way because it's my way or the highway. Your way keeps leading you astray. I'm rapping in the house of God because freestyling up in here. And our way always leads us to the wrong way. How can we get to God's way doing it our way? And you know what? God doesn't want our obedience to feel better about being God. God wants us to fully obey because he wants to, us to be fully free and fully blessed. Because God is a good God. If he tells us to not do something or to do something, it's because he has something better in store for us in the future. Come on, somebody. You know what's crazy about the Amalekites is it, they were the nation that kept coming back to try to take Israel out. They were the nation after the Red Sea, after they crossed and, and, and walked into the miracle of God, that they were the nation that tried to take them out. And God's instruction was, I want you to take them out fully or they'll keep following you. Wow. Ain't it crazy we go into new seasons and it seems like our past season is following us? 
and it feels like we're getting promoted, but we're still struggling with the thing he tried to deal with 20 years ago. And it's not because God is not powerful. It's because we're not fully honest. And in a season where he tells us to be fully honest, we only give partial honesty. In a season where he wants to get us fully free, we step back and keep something alive that keeps trying to attack us in the future. Come on, I'm preaching in the house. Come on, let's take care of the enemy. Let's stop letting him trip us up and taking us out in future seasons. Hey. Keep alive things that God is trying to take care of in our life. He loves us and he knows best for us. To fully obey is to obey. To partially obey is to disobey. And I want to encourage you today. Sometimes you could trick yourself and I could trick myself. We could look like we're obeying God, but not really. Saul was like, we're keeping, the, we're keeping it alive to worship you, God. And he was trying to use manipulation to get his way. And it took somebody on the outside to say, nope, I know better than that. Nope. We need friends in our life, by the way, that could call things out. We need friends. If, if everyone in your circle is agreeing with you, you need a new circle. If everyone in your people group is not challenging you, come on, somebody, you need a new people group. Because if we don't listen to those people in our life, we'll lose those people in our life. This would be the last time Samuel would give instruction to Saul. Because partial obedience is, is disobedience. Number two, I want you to write this down. Pride tries to serve God without God's power. Pride, it, try, it tries to serve God without God's power. We give a detail in 1 Samuel 14 that lets us into the life of uh, Saul. And that at a previous battle that he won, the Bible said that in verse 35 of 14, it says, then Saul built an altar to the Lord. And look at this detail. It says, it was the first time he had done this. The first time, and it gives us that detail because it's trying to let us know something that seldom did Saul worship God after a victory. And the Bible says in 1 Samuel 15, as, Sam, as Samuel approaches Saul, the Bible says that Saul had gone to Carmel, and there he was, and he set up a monument in his own honor and has turned and gone down to Gilgal. So when Samuel approaches Saul, he's literally like setting up his own monument because he forgot where he came from. And when we forget where we came from, we'll treat our victories like they were because of us. So instead of building an altar to the Lord to worship the Lord, he built a monument for himself. Because he, he forgot he was from the lowest of lows. He, he, for, he forgot he was from the tribe of Benjamin. He forgot that on an ordinary day, God pulled him out the crowd and anointed him and blessed him and used him. And that he wasn't looking for God, but God was looking for him. And there are moments in our lives when God blesses us. And the very thing God blessed us with, we use to walk away from God. I've seen it so much in church. God, I need you to put my life back together. And he put your life back together and you're never in church again. God, I want you to bless my business, and he blesses the business. And you don't honor him in the business anymore because he already, you already got the blessing. And that's a sad place to be when we use the blessings of God to go away from God. And Saul, he is taking the victory from himself because he forgot that his success and his power came from being in fellowship with God. Because God was with him, he won the battle. Because God anointed him, he was successful. We forget. Have you forgotten? Pastor Benny, a couple weeks ago, it was so profound. He said, when we worship much, we, we remember much. And the reason we don't remember much is because seldom do we worship after a victory. Seldom do we go back to God to say thank you. And it's, it, it's no accident that he wasn't a worshiper and that he was a bad rememberer. <laughs> There's no accident. Because seldom did he worship. I don't know about you, but... I don't want to act like the blessings in my life come from me. I don't want to take what God has done in my life for granted. I don't want to act like I could live my life without him. I don't want to act like everything that I've been given, the influence and the ability to communicate in a church community, that could be taken away from me in a moment. So I want to step back and say, God, thank you for choosing me. God, thank you for sending me a beautiful wife. God, thank you for picking me up when I fell down. God, thank you for helping me overcome that addiction. God, thank you for reworking my life even when I didn't want you. God, I need you. God, I'm in fellowship with you. God, I need you to come on somebody in the house. Is anybody grateful? that God has blessed you? Is anybody grateful that he's anointed you? Is anybody grateful that he's connected to you? Come on. Hey. Hey. 
He's blessed us. And I don't want to forget that. And I love worship because worship doesn't just remember. Worship helps us to take off the weight from us. And many of us, we are overwhelmed with anxiety and pressure because we feel like we have control over our future and control over our life. But no, God is in control. And when we talk about giving glory to God, glory talks about his benevolence, his goodness, his faithfulness. But it also speaks about his weight, that God can handle the weight that I cannot. I almost titled this message, Lose the Weight. Get the weight off of you. Come on, it's like it doesn't belong to you. I don't want the glory. God, I want you to get the glory. God, I'm blessed because you're glorious, because you're awesome. I want to set up an altar to worship you, not a monument to worship myself. Hey, lose the weight. Let's give it back to God. Whew. Number three, write this down. Pride it. It refuses to believe who God has made you to be. It refuses to, be, to believe what, who God has made you to be. It's important. This is important. I need you to lean in for this one. Because often we think pride is this exterior, loud, open, public thing. Like we think pride is the guy that takes off his shirt at every party. We think pride is the guy who talks about himself a lot. But pride sometimes is more subtle than that. Pride sometimes can be masqueraded in other things to try to take us out. And when you look at the life of Saul, you see throughout the pattern of his life, he had a subtle pride in his life that I want to talk about today. You know what that pride is called? Insecurity. Insecurity looks almost like humility in our day and age. God, not me. No, no, not me. You can't. No, God, no. You somebody else. God, no, 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 no. You know, you know in the story of Saul? When he was first anointed, he went to his uncle, and his uncle asked, what did Samuel say? And he did not tell his uncle that Samuel anointed him king because he was afraid. And it's okay if you start that way, but you can't end that way. The Bible would say during his coronation, during the service that would put him into kingship, they couldn't find Saul. They were like, boop, 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 boop. we are going to anoint the first king of Israel, Saul. Saul? Nobody? No Saul? No, the Bible says they had to pray to God to ask where Saul was. That's how lost he was. And the Bible said they found him hiding behind the supplies because he was so afraid to step in to what God anointed him to do. The Bible would say in 1 Samuel 15 when Samuel confronts Saul, this is some of our problem right here, 15 verse, chapter 15, verse 17. He says, though you are little in your own eyes, are you not the head of the tribes of Israel? And that's some of our problems. We're little in our own eyes. We're little on our own eyes. And we think, God, not me. No, you can't use me. And God's saying, yes, I want to use you. I have anointed you. And we cannot esteem God's value and not value his value system. We cannot say, God, you're worthy of my praise. You're true. You're glorious. And neglect what he says over our life. It's a contradiction. It doesn't make sense. If I value God, I must value his value system. That means if I ascribe to God his honor, I have to receive the honor he ascribes to me. I got to stop. Come on. I got to stop counting myself out of things God's counting me in. I got to stop going through around the same circle. Not me, God. I'm not worthy. I know you're not worthy, but Jesus makes you worthy. God, I don't feel loved. I'm, it's all, that's okay because your feelings are not your God. Stop making your feelings your God. Just because you don't feel loved doesn't mean you aren't loved. The Bible says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that you were so loved that he sent his best gift in your life. God, I don't feel righteous. The Bible says you were made righteous in Christ. He who knew no sin became sin for us so that we might become the righteousness of God. And there comes a time in our life, hear me, I feel this, where we got to start to believe what God says over our life. We, there, there come, what, how long is it going to take, friend? How many sermons? How many podcasts? How many worship experiences? How many days have to go by for you to actually believe God has anointed you? God has appointed you. You need to stop walking around like a slave. You're a son. You're a daughter. You got to stop walking around like a peasant. You're a princess. You're a priest. You come on, somebody. You are, you are royalty to God. You are a holy nation, a royal priesthood, a chosen people. Come on, somebody. I'm not just trying to gas you up. 
I'm trying to point you to God. And what he says about you is true. What the enemy says is irrelevant. What he, listen, if you are tired of living under the dark cloud of inadequacy, if you are tired of letting the parasite of self-pity take you out from doing what God has called you to do, if you are tired of the anxiety that comes from being insecure, come find out what God says about you and bank your life on it. What does God say about me? God, I want to bank my life on it. If you say I'm loved, I'm loved. If you say I'm chosen, I'm chosen. If you say I'm anointed, I'm anointed. If you say I'm, woo, come on. Hey, you're anointed. You're anointed. God has anointed you. Anointed means capable. Anointed means favored. You're anointed to raise those kids. You're anointed to be a husband. You're anointed to be a student. You're anointed to be a friend. You're anointed to be a boss. You're anointed to flip them burgers. It don't matter where you're at. Whatever your hand finds you to do, you are anointed to do what God has called you to do. Let's stop counting ourselves out. Let's stop looking at ourselves as small in our own eyes. God, you've made me, you've made me blessed. You've made me good. You've made me usable, God. Man, when are you going to believe it? When are you going to believe it? Step into it. Let's step into it as God's people. God doesn't want to use somebody else. He wants to use you. Come on. David honored Saul more than Saul honored Saul. David saw Saul's value more than Saul saw God's value. You know what I'm saying? (laughs) Come on. Number four. As the piano comes up, I'm, I'm almost done here. I want you to write this down. Pride, it. It cares more about outward appearance an inward posture. Pride cares more about outward appearance than inward posture. When Samuel confronts Saul in the Bible, you see remorse, but you don't see any repentance from his heart. Matter of fact, in verse 30, you can see Saul, when he got caught, he said, I've sinned. Look what he tells Samuel. I know I've sinned. You caught me. You got me. But, 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 but please, please, please. Hey, Samuel, please honor me. Honor me before the elders of my people and before Israel. I know I messed up, but, 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 please, but please, please, don't tell people. Don't. And he was more concerned about how he looked with others. And he wasn't concerned about his standing with God. He was more satisfied in his position. And he was just, He was unaware that what he was doing was actually hurting the heart of God. There's sometimes in our life we got to realize that remorse isn't repentance. You know, the Bible says worldly sorrow leads to death, but godly sorrow leads to repentance. Worldly sorrow is the sorrow that feels bad about being caught and it feels bad about losing a position. And so your repentance or your remorse is not connected to God's heart. It's connected to other people's opinion. So we don't get fully honest and we don't get fully transparent. We don't come to God broken. But a godly sorrow says, God, I I broke your heart. I may have hurt people, but I broke your heart. And you are calling me back to fellowship with you because, God, you love me. And you know I'm ineffective when I'm disconnected from you power comes from you, my my joy comes from you, my success comes from you, and God, if this is broken, everything's broken. If the connection is broken, everything is broken, friend. I would be worried if Jesus wasn't in your boat, but if Jesus is in your boat, it don't matter what storm comes against your life, you will be able to stand, you will be able to endure, you'll be able to get through it. Come on, as long as Jesus is in my boat, I'm going to make it. I'm going to win the battle. He was remorseful but not repentant. David would be somebody that completely was different than Saul. David messed up worse than Saul. Can we, can we get real? Don't, don't believe preachers that say David was amazing. He was, he was jacked up. And he fell morally more than Saul did. But his response was everything. 
And that encourages me because it doesn't matter how far you feel from God or how broken you think your life is. As long as your response back to God is holy, he could reestablish, he could reawaken, he could take you back up and he can make you stand again. The righteous will fall seven times, but they get back up again. And come on, nobody is too far from the grace of God. Nobody is too far from the reach of God. It's all about the response. It's about the response, man. God, I broke your heart. Look at David in Psalm 51. Against you and you alone have I sinned. And I've done what is evil in your sight, God. So different from Saul. So different than how we treat our mistakes. And one of the greatest mistakes we can make is not admitting we made mistakes. Hear me, hear me. I feel this for somebody this morning. There's grace available for you. There's mercy available for you. And God is calling us back to repentance. Listen, that word gets misabused by dumb Christians out there. And it sounds like a judgment word. Repent! But repentance is a beautiful word. And I don't just repent when I first come to Jesus because I'm in error sometimes. Sometimes i got to come back to Jesus and say, God, I've gone astray, but I'm coming back to you. I need connection with you. I need your anointing. I need your hand on my life. The Bible says, God, resist the proud. But he gives grace to the humble. There's grace when you're humble. There's grace when you're broken in front of God. When's the last time you were broken in front of God? When was the last time you were fully honest with God? When has our Christianity become something that we fake and something that we put on and something that we we act? When you come to church, I'm blessed. I'm highly favored. I know that's awesome. But are you broken? Are you pretending like you got power when you don't? Are you pretending like you're right with God when you know something is off in your life? Are you pretending like you're walking in life in fellowship with God, but you know when you go to sleep at night, it feels like God is so far. It feels like God is away. God, I've not been living for you. God, I know it started that way, but I want to come back to you. And God will receive a repented heart. It's the last time you've been broken. There's an anointing there. There's a filling there. And I don't want to just use the grace of God to cover my sins. That's cheap grace. I want to use the grace of God to cover my sins and to empower me to live the life he's called me to live. But you will overcome, not by your power, by his. He's anointed you. He's anointed us. He's anointed me. He's anointed all of us to live the life he's called us to live. God, I'm coming back to you. And God says, I can do something with that. Come on, let me embrace you. Come on, let me restore you. Come on, he's full of love. Come on, he's full of mercy. Can anybody testify? He's full of compassion. He's slow to anger. Come on, somebody. And the beauty of the gospel is that Jesus so loved us that he gave his life for us. That he fell on our sword so that we wouldn't have to. Come on, he paid the price we deserve to pay. God resists the proud. He gives grace to the humble. And so today, if we want to stay in the battle, come on, we got to take off the pride. We gotta take off the pride and put on humility. And God, I'm here. I'm available.